So good afternoon, everybody. This is our uh, third year of running this advanced material chemistry course under the uh, auspices of Mobile Bhava National Institute. So basically, uh, normally the first lecture is uh, uh, addressed by uh, Dr. A.K. Tyagi, who is the chairman of this course, but uh, who is the chairman of this course. But this year, since this is already the third year running, so we also have the knack of doing the things. And this year, the course is not being introduced formally because it is already very popular, apparently. So, Dr. Tyagi will definitely come midway between the course for your feedback uh, and for other suggestions that you would want to make. This course, as Dr. Anshu Singhal has already sent you the uh, outline of the course, it is basically divided into five parts. Uh, it will be taken by five lecturers, but divided into four parts. So, the first one is the general materials chemistry, which I would take, followed by uh, characterization techniques, which would be taken by Dr. Kanubari, and then uh, the chemical ultra trace trace uh, analytical technique, which is also a very special part of this course. Normally, worldwide, if you see the materials chemistry course does not really contain this component, but we have incorporated it to make it uh, useful to a wide number of applicants. That would be taken by our senior colleague, Dr. Rakesh Singhal. Followed by the fourth part of the course, which is about functional material, and it has two parts. One would be uh, dealing with the various functional material like catalytic and, you know, energy storage material and all. That would be dealt by Dr. Dimpal Datta. And the last part, which is device-worthy material. The materials that are particularly applied for device applications, that would be taken by Dr. A.K. Chohan. So that is kind of, uh, and you have, all of you know, it's a 30 lecture course. Each lecture uh, would span over like 90 minutes or so. Uh, so today we started and we hope to have a very successful third running of this course with you people. And uh, I really look forward to, I would be taking first seven lectures and I look forward to very interesting seven uh, sessions with you. One thing that I would expect is uh, best would be that the course would have been conducted, you know, across the table with you and me sitting face to face. Because this is how materials chemistry should be taught, especially the basic general materials chemistry. Uh, but given the fact that we are also looking at, as Dr. Anku Singhal was just discussing with me, at a wider outreach of the course, so we prefer to do it online uh, so that if we can reach to more number of students at the same time. I would also expect, even though the online mode has got certain limitations in terms of interactions, but I would really appreciate if you can come up with your queries. I would try to solve them then and there, but if at all, you know, the course doesn't end with 30 lectures. We are always available to you. Please write back to us whatever query you have, whatever doubt you have, and we would be very, very happy to solve it. And uh, coming to my portion, we'll start with my portion today. Uh, a very general thing that I do is every 15, 20 minutes, we'll take a two minutes break, two to three to four minutes, depending on whether you have any query and, you know, for you to grasp what has been taught in the last 15 to 20 minutes. So this is how we'll go. We'll go at a comfortable pace or the fast pace, depending on how uh, me, uh, I am interacting with you guys and how you guys are coming back to me. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to start with the first part of first lecture of the first part of the course, that is basic solid state chemistry or the basic materials chemistry. Uh, we would like to share the slides now. Okay, so I can click to go to the next. So I'm Vinita Gupta and uh, I've been, I am a solid state chemist and I've been working in materials chemistry for last 22 years now. And uh, my area of specialization is oxide chemistry, oxides for various applications. So please, uh, 
be interactive with me and help me to help you. Okay, this is what I expect from you. So the first uh, thing is general materials chemistry. Today's lecture will have a lot of things that you would already have studied. I believe that solid state chemistry or the basic general materials chemistry is introduced right uh, uh, nowadays in class 11 where you start knowing about it little by little, step by step. You learn more about it in your undergrad and postgrad. But then uh, uh, the interesting thing is because I have been sitting in some of the interview committees and all, this is the area where the students or the candidates, they also tend to goof up. So let's revise this for many of you, for some of you, it would be revision. Some of the concepts would be new and some of the concepts will try to uh, solidify as we go ahead in this process. Okay. So material science, why is material science important? I mean, uh, if you look back or if you just look uh, around you, everything is a material, right? The table, the screen, your PC screen, your smartphones, everything is ultimately made of materials. In fact, materials are so important that if you, even if you don't really need to sit in a science class for that, if you go back to your history classes, even the ages in the prehistoric time, they have been named after the kind of materials that were developed or used in it. So we know of stone age, we know of iron age, we know of now silicon age, in between we had concrete age and so on, right? So uh, that shows the importance of material was always there. It was there, it is there, and it is always going to be there because the development of the society is intricately related to the development in the materials. All you, you know of the sustainable development goals, the nowadays society is looking for more efficient energy materials and all that. Everything is intricately related to how we can tune our material to get the property that we want to get more efficient material, to get more cheaper material. But the property of the material is ultimately the result of its structure, right? Whether a material is an electrical material or it is a magnetic material or it will store charge, it will store energy, will ultimately depend on its crystal structure, its morphology, its powder properties and so on. That shows that we have to start and this is how your solid state chemistry and general materials chemistry gains significance. So what is material science? It is basically the study of properties of solid materials and how those properties are influenced by materials composition and structure. Now when we talk of structure, all of you know, so we have been taught uh, right from our, in fact, primary and middle classes that there are, uh, excuse me, that there are two classes of material which you generally identify. We say the materials are designed material and they are amorphous material. A broad definition that is taught to you when you grow up a little in your 11th and 12th is crystalline materials are those which have got long range, three dimensionally, periodically arranged atom science or molecules. They have regular repeating pattern. Amorphous material, they are solids, they are super cool liquid. They lack long range periodic arrangement of atom. And there is, if you want to find out, okay, this is a small unit, can I repeat it and arrange, uh, reproduce my structure? That is possible for crystalline material, but not for the amorphous material. So, those of you who have been working in nanomaterials, nano is a buzzword. It has been the buzzword for last almost three decades now. Nanomaterials fall in between your crystalline solids and amorphous solids. Okay. So again, coming back to the basic definition, as I told you, this lecture is going to be a good mix of your basic concepts that you've already studied. We're going to revise it. And we'll also try to see some of the concepts that you've studied, but probably not have understood that much. So what is a unit cell? That's the smallest repeating unit that describes the full symmetry of the crystal structure. So you always, always have to remember that unit cell has got the minimum volume. It is the smallest unit. If you repeat it three dimensionally, it will create your crystal structure. But this smallest unit should have 
all the symmetry of the structure that you are trying to represent. I mean, you can have even a smaller unit for that particular structure, but if it does not have all the symmetry elements that are expected for the structure that you're trying to reproduce, then it is not a unit cell. Okay. So let's say how to select a unit cell. Now you look at uh, your structure A. Okay. That's a periodic arrangement of balls which are filled and which are unfilled. A regular 3D periodic arrangement. Now I can draw a unit cell the way I have drawn in B. I join all the unfilled circle or I join all the uh, filled circle and the unfilled fall on the edge centers or the way I have drawn D or E or F. Out of these, F is definitely out because it is not taking care of all the atoms or the points here I would mention. E could be taken, but only when you take it in two dimension, like how it is shown on the screen right now. If I try to reproduce or repeat it in the C direction also, then all the symmetry elements will not be retained. So actually B and C are the correct choices for the unit cell for this particular material, even though your F has got the smaller unit. It has a minimum volume, but it does not represent the maximum symmetry. And so with E, when we go for three dimensions. Okay, I have, defi I have defined the unit cell, but how do I define the unit cell? Shall I say it is a cube? Shall I say it is a circle? No. There are six parameters, which if you define, that will define your unit cell. So what are those six parameters? How, what is its length along the x-axis, which we call A by convention, length along the y-axis, which is called B, length along the z-axis or the z-axis, which we call as C. And what is the angle between A and B, B and C, C and E? The angle that is between A and B opposite to A is called alpha. Angle opposite to B is called beta. And angle opposite to C is called gamma. So these are the six lattice parameters or the crystal structure parameters A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma. All right? So... Uh, again, basics. Now, basically, you have studied in your book, there are crystal systems. So, what are the crystal systems? They are nothing but the seven independent unit cell shapes that are possible in three dimensions. Okay. You know, a very interesting thing is that the students will go and they will learn. We have cubic, we have tetragonal, we have triclinic, hexagonal. You know, it is like this. We say... I have a cube and the cube should have these particular symmetry elements. But the interesting thing is, it is the presence or the absence of the symmetry element that forms the shape of the unit cell. So it is not vice versa that you have a cube. That is why you should have four C3 elements. No, the structure should have, the unit cell should have three C3 axis. Then only if you if you are able to create 3C3 axis, your unit cell will automatically become cubic. That means it will have A is equal to B is equal to C, alpha is equal to beta is equal to gamma or 90 degrees. So what I, this is probably a little change in your thought process that I will introduce here. The unit cell shapes are governed by presence and absence of symmetry elements. It is not vice versa. The shapes do not define the unit cell, rather the presence of symmetry element decides the shape of the unit cell. So uh, there are various symmetry elements that we talk about, right? These are axis of rotation, then your mirror planes, then your uh, axis of inversion, point of inversion and so on. These are some common axis of rotation which I would like to revise with you today. So what is a C3 axis? Now all of you are, uh, you know, experienced enough to understand, but with younger students, we also have to show them, you take your dice, the dice with, you, with which you play Ludo or uh, your snakes and ladder, hold it along the body diagonal, that body diagonal is C3 axis of rotation. By C3, if you uh, hold it along its body diagonal 
and rotate it by 120 degree, you will get a similar configuration. And again by 120 degree, similar configuration. Third time by 120 degree, you will get identical configuration. So how do we define the number that subscript? That is the angle of rotation divided by 360 degree. Similarly, your C4 axis is in that cube, it passes along the pair of opposite faces. In this, if you see, you can very well imagine that if you rotate it by 90 degree, you will get similar configuration. For getting identical, you have to rotate it four times, right? Because four times 90 degree makes it 360 degree. Similarly, we have C6 in a hexagonal uh, a 3D structure and a C2 axis, if I rotate, if I hold my cube in such a way that I'm actually holding one of the edge, then the line passing to the edge is the C2 axis of rotation. Okay, now what are the seven crystal systems that we talk about? Very hurriedly, you know about it, cubic, everything simple, A is equal to B is equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma, or 90. Tetragonal, what you do? You simply elongate or compress one of the axes. So C is not equal to A is equal to B. And also remember, most of the time by convention, we write C as different, but it can be B, it can be A as well. But all the angles are still 90 degrees. And what is the essential symmetry element which will lead to this particular unit cell here? That you should have at least one fourfold axis. One C4 axis, and it will actually be parallel to your lattice parameter A, B, or C, which is unequal. Okay. Orthorhombic is like your shoe box. Uh, none of the three axes are equal, but all the angles are 90 degrees. Now, in this shoe box, if you place your hand over the top of the shoe box and you know tilt it in either right direction or the left direction, what will happen is all the three axes are not equal. Obviously, that we started with, one of the angle will distort and it will not be 90 degree and you will get monoclinic unit cell. Similarly, we have hexagonal, trigonal. Triclinic is, it does not have any symmetry element at all. All the three axis parameters are different. All the three angles are different and they are not equal to 90 degree. So these are the seven Universal unit cell shapes that define seven crystal system. Okay, this is the pictorial representation. I'm sure the, the slides are, would be shared with you. Uh, these uh, lectures would be shared with you, so you will have any of this with uh, you. So you can visualize cubic, tetragonal, orthorhombic, tilt the orthorhombic, your monoclinic, triclinic, rhomboidal. Rhomboidal is another name for trigonal. How do you get rhomboidal? Very, very easy visualization. Take your cube dice with which you play Ludo and what you do is hold it along the body diagonal and elongate it, you know, stretch it. You will get the rhomboidal unit cell. All right, moving on to the next slide. Again, a concept that you've heard so many times. What is lattice? Lattice is nothing but three-dimensional array of points with which you can represent your structure. For example, on the left-hand side, what you see is two-dimensional pictorial representation of sodium chloride unit cell. Okay, very, very, one very, very important point. I'm sure all of you know, even if you do not know, lattice point may or may not contain an atom or ion as long as it is representing the periodicity that you want to uh, present. Now, what do I mean when I say that? In that NaCl on left-hand side, I can put one lattice point on NaCl, NaCl, and I would get the three-dimensional uh, periodicity. But even if you place a lattice point between NaCl midway, the second would come between Cl, Na, third would come between Na and Cl, now your lattice point is not actually lying on the atom, but still it is representing the same three-dimensional periodicity, okay? So the point that I make is, want to make is, lattice point may or may not contain atom ion as long as 
it is representing all the symmetry elements that you want to present. Okay. One more thing that I would want to say, you would also often come across the word which is called primitive lattice. Okay. Primitive lattice means, we'll talk about that in next slides, but I'm sure you know about that. It has got only one atom per unit cell. If you join your atoms the way I have joined on the left hand side, shown as B, okay, here it is only one lattice atom. We'll talk about it if it is not clear. Whereas if you join it the way I've joined in A, there is an extra atom in the center, okay? These are centered lattice. Why? When you do not have any other atom other than on the corners, it is called the primitive lattice. I hope this much is clear and it will become clearer on the way. Another important concept, what is a basis? Okay, now here the fact that the lattice point need not coincide with your atom and ion become important when you understand what the basis is. Okay, now you just look at this figure. Okay, the crystal is those arrangement of flowers. Hmm? I want to reproduce that arrangement of flowers. Now, if I go on the left hand side, I can say that if I put one flower on the points that I have made there, I will be able to get the crystal structure which is on the right hand side, right? So lattice is actually that framework in which you can put something to get your crystal structure. And that something is called basis, okay? So basis plus lattice give you your crystal structure. When we are talking about simple structures, let's say iron unit cell, then if basis is equal to one iron atom. But if I'm talking of structures such as NaCl or even more complicated, then basis become a combination of more than one atom. For example, in NaCl, the basis is not just Na, not just Cl, it is one NaCl unit. I hope it is clear. We will all talk about it again when we come to studying the crystal structure. Again, on the right hand side, there's another example. This is your space lattice, the black points, and that black point with the pink point is your basis. If you combine this two, you get the crystal structure. I hope it is clear. I know these are easier things. We've already done it. But it's always good to brush up before we move on to the other things. Lattice types, okay? What are lattice types? So basically, there are four lattice types that have been universally described. One is simple cubic. One is base centered. Some people also call it end centered. In which, okay, and then body centered and then face centered. Now, as the name suggests, simple cubic is the lattice points are only at the corner of the cube. And let us also try to cover, suppose, now I have a cube on this cube, on all the four sides of this cube, below this cube. Every corner atom, if you can visualize, is contributing to eight cubes. So that means one point is actually contributing one by eight into one cube. And how many such corners are there? Eight, okay? So there is one lattice point in the simple cubic lattice and we denote it by P. In the base center, the pair of your opposite faces have got, also have got lattice point other than in addition to the corner. And if you see, you all know about it, one face is actually shared between two cubes because I can place one cube on top of it. So that means that face wala atom is contributing half to one cube. So how much do I have now? One by eight into eight plus half into two. So we have two lattice points in the base center cubic cell. Similarly, in the body center cubic cell, we have one contributed by corners and the one that is lying at the body center is wholly solely contributing only to one cube. So there are two lattice points in the BCC unit cell and we call a lattice as FCC or the face centered lattice when in addition to the corner, all your faces have got one lattice point. These six faces contribute half each, half into six, three lattice points. So a FCC unit cell has got four lattice points. 
So in nutshell, the different lattice types are primitive, body center, face center, end center, denoted by P, I, F, and C. All right. This we already covered in the light, last slide, how to count the number of atoms in the unit cell. Brevise lattice. This I'm sure all of you have read about it, but probably the concept is not very clear. So what we say is Brevise lattice is the, why actually you can ask me once I've studied lattice, why do I need to study Brevise lattice? See, this is because you're studying from the concept, unit cell, lattice. Device lattice, crystal system. But ultimately, if I tell you, if I give you an XRD pattern, I ask you to solve the structure, there you will not be able to find a unit cell or a lattice type. There you have to start with the combinations. Okay. And revised lattice is one such combination. Revised lattice is a combination of unit cell shapes, which we also know are seven crystal systems. And the lattice type, which we also know, are of four types. We just started in the previous slide. So now, combination of unit cell shape and the lattice type give us Brevise lattice. Now ask me, you know, okay, now I'll tell you there are 14 Brevise lattices possible. The question that immediately arises, we are talking of combinations, right? So we have seven crystal system and we have four lattice type. Then why do we not have 28 Brevise lattices? Right? That's a very valid question. The combination should be 28. The thing is that uh, most of these lattices can be represented by the other lattice or sometimes the combination is not allowed symmetrically. I'll give you an example. For example, you consider your cube. Okay? You consider your dice. And now you consider the C-centered lattice. Your crystal system is cubic. Your lattice I am saying is you take C-centered and uh, consider this particular combination. Now your cube has got a lattice point on the uh, opposite faces along the C direction. Okay. Now this combination is not possible. Why is it not possible? Because what did we learn in the some, some slides, uh, previous slides? A cubic system has to have C3 axis. That C3 passes through body diagonal. Now you imagine that your C face is centered. It has got a lattice point. Okay. And you hold your Q in the direction of the body diagonal so that you are holding the body diagonal. Rotate it by 120 degrees. Because you are only one, a pair of faces centered, a pair of faces got lattice point. If you rotate it by 120 degree, you will not be able to reproduce the original structure. So your C3 is lost. That is why this is symmetrically not allowed. Other option is that sometime, whatever you are calling uh, this as a brevised lattice can be represented by a smaller unit cell. And then I will go with that. Because for me, I have to have the smallest unit that has the maximum symmetry and it can represent my structure. And how is that possible? Let's take one example. Topmost left hand side figure is a simple tetragonal lattice and it is a brevised lattice, simple tetragonal, which I also call as primitive lattice type tetragonal unit cell. So it is a combination of primitive lattice and a tetragonal unit cell. Suppose I make a face center tetragonal, which is shown in the middle. Now what happens is if you see in the third figure on right hand side topmost, I can actually make a unit cell joined by green lines. Right now, if I try to find out the dimension of that green line, okay, dimension of the space center tetragonal, the middle fi uh, figure was A, okay, A, B, and C. But if I come to the third figure, what happens is it's uh, in the second figure, if I say the face diagonal is root 2a, we you know A, A root 2a. Now, in third figure, that green line is root 2a by 2, that is A by root 2. Now, A by root 2 is smaller than A, isn't it? Now, if A by root 2 is smaller than A, I would go with this unit cell and not with face center tetragonal. Now, you carefully observe that third figure. What is that unit cell? Suppose my unit cell was centered. It is again tetragonal, but body centered. So, 
That means if I have a face center tetragonal brevis lattice, I can represent it by body center tetragonal brevis lattice, which has got smaller volume. So by convention, this should be my unit cell. Okay. So now you understand, now you have seen how by virtue of possibility of obtaining a smaller unit cell, I can negate some of the combinations forming the revised ladder. Similarly, example two is end centered cubic. Okay, that end centered cubic can actually be represented by simple tetragon. That is how, even though we have seven crystal system, four lattice type, yielding 28 revised lattice in practicality, reality, only 14 revised lattices exist. Because the rest of them either are not allowed by symmetry or can be represented by a smaller unit cell. Okay. So we'll take a break for two minutes. Okay. These are, I'll just flash this. These are the 14 revised lattices. You don't need to remember it. You just need to understand the concept. Okay. Maximum revised lattices are observed in cubic system, two in tetragonal, and then triclinic has got only one revised lattice, which is Primitive writing. All right. So, sorry, maximum are possible in orthorhombic. Cubic has got three. So, we'll take a break for a minute. Uh, if you have any doubt, any question, any query about whatever we have discussed in last few minutes or about the next classes which you would want to study or anything, you can just type it in the um, chat box. Even if it is something general that you would want to say about the course, about, uh, you know, your interest or anything, I would be happy to hear in next two minutes. Okay, uh, so in that case, we shall move to the next slide. Okay. An important condition of the brevised lattice is that the arrangement of the lattice point around any and every lattice point in the brevised lattice should be similar. For example, if you look at this figure on the left hand side, do I have stylus or something? Do it. If you look at this figure in the right hand side, all the points have got similar surroundings. Just look at any point, it, it will have similar. But you, if you come to this right hand side figure, this is the honeycomb structure. If uh, those of you who are doing research would have heard about graphene. Graphene is a single or multi-layered graphite. It is a honeycomb structure, but we don't call this particular hexagonal arrangement as brevised lattice. Why? If you carefully observe point P and point Q, okay, the arrangement of the atoms is similar around them. Why? If I'm standing at Q, what I'll see is one point in this direction, one point in this direction, and one point in this direction. And this is actually mirrored at P. If I'm standing at P, I will see one point going forward, one point going here and here. 
but in case of r it is actually one point is going here so basically uh, in general they are all connected to three atoms but it is or it is kind of reoriented the orientation is different as compared to p and q okay that means if i am standing at r then what i am observing around myself because here that single line was going in the back direction and then these two are in the front so the orientation is 180 degree rotated okay so this lattice we do not call brevis lattice if at all we have described a lattice as a brevis lattice undoubtedly whatever point i'm standing at my surroundings will be totally similar okay so this is how this is a very important condition when we classify the brevis lattice coming to a very simple concept again lattice plane miller indices directions what are lattice plane okay so people tell me that lattice planes are the planes present in the structure but by how does the structure know that it has planes the structure does not have planes right it is only the reference grid that we provide to ourselves okay so what we say is we take a cube we divide cube into various number of plane and then we say okay in this particular structure this plane has got atoms that plane has got four atoms this plane has got two atoms so what it is giving me it is giving me some kind of a reference grid by which i can understand and visualize where actually the atoms are present in the unit cell so lattice plane is only a concept based on unit cell shape and size and lattice plane are characterized by the interplanar spacing d which is fixed for each set of plane and how do we define the lattice plane all of you know it is defined by a set of three numbers which we also call as miller indices and miller indices if you ask basically it is nothing but how your plane is intersecting the three main crystallographic axes that is a b or c or x y z okay now there is a method by which you can determine miller indices simple method but i would also urge you to visualize rather than you know learning all those method the method okay i will tell you method as well all of you have studied what you do is suppose i have asked you to find the miller indices of this particular plane uh, the red plane uh, what you do is you see where the plane intersect uh, Uh, the intercept made by plane on three axes for example here it makes one on x axis but it does not touch it uh, touches b axis and uh, uh, y axis or z axis at all so it is infinity and infinity because it is not making an intercept once you know what are the intercept take the reciprocal here it is 1 by 1 then 1 by infinity 1 by infinity and it is 1 0 0 okay that is how we determine the miller indices but now simply if you ask me how do i i don't need to really take such reciprocal and all i look at the plane and i'll see uh, in how many parts it is dividing my a b and c okay this particular plane is actually you know intersecting at a only so it is dividing my a axis into a one part but it is not touching b or c so it is not inter uh, making a uh, dividing it into absolutely no parts so it is 1 0 0 i'll give you another example let's go to this okay so you look at this particular plane so it is actually dividing my x axis on if my a lattice parameter fall into one one part b axis into one but it is not touching c axis at all so what is my uh, miller indices of this dividing a into one part dividing b into one part but not touching c axis at all clear okay similarly for this plane it is dividing it is intersecting my a axis into one part b into one c into one so it is 1 1 1 okay some uh, points that you should know because conventions are also very very important miller indices are denoted without comma if you put comma it will become the coordinate of the point okay and in small brackets if you are having equivalent set of plane now what do you mean by equivalent set of plane 
if you have a cubic unit cell that is your a is equal to b then one of a is equal to one of b right and it will equal to one of c but if your a is smaller than b then one of a is smaller than one of a one of b so when you have a cubic unit cell your 100 010 001 Minus one zero 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 minus one zero 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 minus one are equivalent, right? And then we say that they belong to a family of uh, planes, lattice planes. And in that case, we denote it by we take any one. I can use one zero zero or zero one zero anything, and then denote it by curly bracket. This shows that it belongs to one particular family of planes. Negative Miller indices. For example, if a plane is intersecting uh, x-axis at minus one, are denoted by bar on the top. All right. So these are certain conventions that we need to follow. Then similarly, we can also denote Miller indices for direction. For example, I'm talking of a particular direction. My atom lies in that particular direction from the origin. So how do I do that? Simply. Mark that direction and draw a parallel line to that particular direction, but now it should pass through the origin. Okay. Suppose any random line, this, and your cube was here. Okay. Now draw a parallel line to this, but it should pass through the origin, and then see what are the coordinates it is actually making at x, y, and z axis, and that is your direction. It is as simple as that, and directions are denoted by denoted by square brackets. And if you have family of direction, that is denoted by triangle. It's very simple. Just few conventions that we need to revise. Coming to the interesting parts now, we'll revise uh, fat of it because most of you have done it. Very very simple things. I will tell you small simple things that uh, I know. And I want you to carry with you. These are simple, but most of the time we try to ignore the difference. What is crystal chemistry and what is crystallography? Okay, crystallography is all the experimental methods that you use to determine structure. X ray crystallography. Why? It is a method that you are using to determine the structure. And when I say crystal chemistry, okay, today we will study crystal chemistry. What does it mean? Description of the structure, classification of the structure, factors that are actually governing that structure. What are the conditions under which that structure would be stable? What will be the relation between the structure and the properties that it is exhibiting? All this constitute crystal chemistry. I hope just read this different. Most of the time, we just you know when we are reading the book, we go through it. And for us, uh, if somebody asked me, "What is crystallography? What is crystal chemistry?" We use these terms interchangeably. Don't use that. Try to learn. Try to remember these subtle differences. All right. Moving on. How can I define the crystal structure? If I ask you to tell me, okay, how do you define any cell structure? One thing is, you tell me what its unit cell is. You tell me where are the atoms and ions placed in the unit cell. You tell me what are the A, B, and C axes and alpha, beta, gamma. I can repeat it in three dimensional, and I will get the crystal structure. So that is one way of representing. Second way is closed pack structure. Closed pack means you tell me, okay, an ions are placed this way, and this is how the ions are placed between them. Fine. That also because anyway here too you are describing the three dimensional view, space filling polyhedra. We'll talk about this particular representation also. What is in NaCl? What is the polyhedra of Na? What is the polyhedra of Cl? How they are linked to each other? Okay, these are also some of the other ways by which you can explain somebody what is the structure. The second and third are better in the sense that they give you a better three-dimensional view because if you tell me, okay, this is a polyhedra, they are sharing edges, I will be able to view. In three dimension, and that will give me a better visualization. But unit cell shape, size, and position is the more repeated, repeated more reported. When we study the literature, these are the kind of data that are reported, which are pertaining to the unit cells. All right, coming to the closed pack structure, 
will brush up. You know what are hexagonal close packing and cubic close packing? They are your close pack structure. So what are the guiding factors? When do I say that I have a close pack structure? I have to achieve maximum density because that gives me strong bonds, because that gives me lowering of energy, that gives me stabilization. Okay, so uh, just backing up what you have read in 11th and 12th, suppose this is the two-dimensional uh, layer. This is the best way I can pack my structure. Okay, There's another way also. Here I'm putting uh, these circles, uh, like in between uh, the circle in the opposite row, I can as well place them here, but that won't give me close packing. The gap would be too much. This is the best way to pack. Now, okay, in this two-dimensional, what is, uh, if you have the close packing, the number of ions will be closest number of atoms possible is six. Now, suppose I want to place a second layer of identical uh, spheres. What, what I can do is, there is only one way, basically. I can put it in the interstices that were made on the, either this interstices which are pointing upward or this interstices which are pointing downward, but not both. That is not possible. I get the second layer. Now, the interest happens when I decide how to place my third layer. If I place my third layer directly over the first layer, I get hexagonal close packing. If I place it again, okay, I'll just show you this. Suppose I place my second layer on the interstices pointing upward and I get a second layer, but in the second layer, I should place it on the interstices pointing downward. Then my three layers are actually differently placed with each other and I got ABC, ABC, which is called cubic close packing. There's nothing much to discuss. You know that here. Now, what is the closest number of uh, neighbors for an atom either in HCP or CCP? Okay. A very simple way to view is if I have a two dimensional, suppose I'm talking about this particular atom, how many atoms are there surrounding it? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. And I have put one, I suppose I put the second layer on this triangle pointing upward. Then one, two, and three. So three up, three below, six in the same plane. So the closest neighbors possible in the 3D packing is 12. So 12 is the coordination number. Okay. We'll talk about this when we come to this. You have still not studied about unit cell. Now, this is something that you will need to be with me if you want to understand. Okay. Unit cell of hexagonal close packing and cubic close packing. They were close pack structure. Now, in those close pack structure, I want you to see how the unit cell looks like. Hexagonal, it is easier to understand. Why is it easier to understand? Because suppose your close pack layer were like this, here in this direction, your unit cell is also in the same direction. And this is what you see here. Okay. This is your layer A. This is your layer B. And this is your layer C. But in CCP, it is not very easy to visualize because your packing of layer is not this way. Okay. No. The packing of layer is actually along body diagonal. You're getting my point? Now the layers are packed this way, this way, this way. Okay. We'll visualize it again. Let's go back to this. Okay. Uh, let me just show you. Fine. I hope just try to be with me. This white is layer A. Okay. The black one is layer B and your again white one is layer C. Now let us talk about hexagonal first. Okay, this is your hexagonal. The layer A, this. This is layer B and this is layer C. But in case of cubic, you are joining this particular sphere in layer A. Then the corners of the face are actually to these two spheres in layer B. And then it comes back to layer C. So only the topmost face, it involves three layers. Okay. 
So if I say that you can probably imagine that, uh, you know, uh, okay, this is your body diagonal. If you try to see if I join this point with this black point, this is your body diagonal. Okay, a little difficult to visualize, but I'm sure with time, we will be able to do that. Now, because whenever we define the unit cell, we also uh, try to see what are the number of atoms in a particular unit cell. So this is your hexagonal unit cell. Normally, to define this unit cell, we divide this hexagon into three parts. See this way. And this. Can you see this? This is my first. This is my second cuboid. And this is my third cuboid. So unit cell is actually one third of this entire hexagon that you're seeing right now. So that means in this particular unit cell, how many atoms do I have? One, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight these and there is one that is lying in the center so there are two lattice points in the hexagonal unit cell okay that is the first takeaway from this particular lecture and if i want you to tell me the coordinates for this lattice point so whenever we have to tell the coordinate of the lattice point we can take any of the corner as origin okay and origin we mark as zero 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 and if you ask me, there are eight points, why am I only saying that it is one lattice point? So please go back to the previous discussion. Each corner is of contributing only one by eight. Eight corners, one. That means one lattice point. That means only zero, zero, zero. This also shows that all your eight corners are equal. Now coming to the coordinate of this particular lattice point, this you will have to this you will be able to imagine better if you concentrate this particular figure, okay? Now, one thing is very clear that this if this is my C axis, this is lying at 0.5. Is that clear? Okay, so 0.5 means one of the coordinate is definitely half. The C coordinate is half. Now, talking about X coordinate and Y coordinate, concentrate here. This is your X axis. And this is your y axis. So even though I am not able to show you quantitatively, you can very clearly see that this is kind of 1 by 3 ka coordinate. This was 0, 0. And this is 2 by 3. Okay. So the coordinate for the second lattice point, which lies here, is 1 by 3, 2 by 3, and half. So I hope it is clear. It is hexagonal close packing is a little difficult to visualize when we assign the coordinate, it will become even more difficult when I will ask you to visualize the octahedral board. But together, we see that we'll be able to do that. Okay. For uh, FCC unit cell, from the close packing, it will be very difficult to show you the coordinates. But that you have to remember for me now that for the CCP, Close packing, the unit cell is face center. Okay. And what is a face centered unit cell? Eight atoms on the corner and then six atoms on the face centers. All right. Now, if I have to give the coordinates to this, consider and suppose I consider this as the origin. So, one of the lattice points is the corner atom which is 0, 0, 0, okay? Second lattice point is this one, let's say. The C coordinate is 0 and the X and Y coordinates are half, 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 0. Similarly, this one is half, 0, half and the other one is 0, half, half. So, unit cell of CCP is FCC. There are four lattice points given by this. Unit cell of XCP is hexagonal and there are two lattice points. So please remember 
these things. If there is any doubt, please ask me because for me also, if I keep on repeating these things, these are super interesting things to make you visualize. But across the screen, it can get very monotonous and very boring. So I'll give you another two minutes. If you want to ask any question, please ask in the chat box. See, there are two things. I can go on uh, speaking and uh, we do not interact at all. It might be easier, but it would be boring for me as well as you. So it'd be very good. Even if you are understanding, just type in that you are understanding. So I know that I'm not talking to screen and I'm talking to people who are sitting across the screen and listening to me. Is there anything in specific that you would want me to repeat? Thank you, Varki. Good to know that you're there. Nice name. Okay, Dheeraj. Can we take a break for a minute? And then we again restart at, let's say, 5-5. Five, five. It's 5-2 five, now, right? 5 okay. Go down, man. It is clear to you, uh, what's his name? All clear? You've studied all these things? What is this name? Satish. 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 You studied all these things. Do you want me to go faster? Okay, since anyway, we are taking a break. So after this uh, particular basic general chemistry, we'll actually do some complex structures. And then uh, we'll move on to what are the different kind of defects that can exist in solid? How do the defects evolve? Uh, we'll study about the phase transitions and uh, classification of phase transitions and how they're important in the property. We'll also have a very interesting part on structure property relationship. Where by taking two, three uh, specific example, I will tell you how the structure can manifest into the property and how it is in my hand to tune that structure so that I can also alter the property. That is what the material scientist dream is, you know. Uh, anybody wants to have control in life. So it is absolutely wonderful to have a control on the structure so that you can, you know, get the property of your choice. Of course, you need to have, what now what would this require? I want to make a key to the lock, but I need to understand what is the structure inside that lock, which can make me make a key according to those dimensions. So that is what uh, the structure does to you. And a good understanding of it will uh, help you to 
you know it's like a video game play to get what you want out of it so it's an absolutely wonderful field to start with of course i would be touching only the basic aspects i hope uh, in the functional material part you get the taste of how the more contemporary things are all right okay we'll move on to our uh, thing we are going a little slow but anyway this is a first lecture so okay uh, one thing that you need to understand is which of course is very clear if i uh, try to spend a little more time but i would love that love to explain that if i know that you're looking at me and i can make you visualize that but till then for every sphere whether it is ccp or hcp you've got one octahedral hole and two tetrahedral holes tetrahedral i can make you visualize right away uh, if you consider this particular structure concentrate on this orange uh, this thing that i'm pointing to okay this is the tip of the tetrahedra and these three are the base of the tetrahedra so this is a tetrahedral hole now imagine this is a tetrahedra pointing uh, uh, you know with the base at the bottom i can also make an inverted tetrahedra because if this is a hexagonal closed packing there will be three spheres on top of this also this is a layer i will have a c layer and this orange one belongs to b b uh, layer so initially the orange one was like this and there were three green spheres now the orange one is like this and there are three green spheres and orange one means all the self spheres are identical right and one orange could contribute to two tetrahedral so this is how we say that for every sphere there are two tetrahedral hole in the closed pack okay octahedra is a little difficult to visualize but if you sit on it you will be able to see that each atom is actually contributing only to one octahedral hole so there is one octahedral hole per lattice atom in the closed pack okay now if i want to see in terms of unit cell for ccp we say the unit cell is fcc so because we'll be using that very often when we'll do the basic structure where are the octahedral holes if i have this cube the octahedral hole is at the body center okay and the edge center so very quickly type in your chat box what is the number of octahedral present in this number of octahedral holes very quickly we just have one minute because we can't be spending time Should I wait for a minute for you to type, or should I just go ahead? All right, we'll we'll go to that. Apparently, uh, we just need to work on this, interacting more, working on interacting more with each other. so the one at the body center is contributing entirely so that contributes one octahedral hole and the one at the edge center one edge is shared between four cubes and there are 12 edges so 12 into uh, 1 by 4 that is 3 so we have four tetrahedral ho octahedral holes all right and it is very obvious because fcc unit cell has got four lattice point one octahedral hole per lattice point so there has to be four octahedral holes and where are the tetrahedral holes located if you take this cube and cut it into eight octants how will you cut it you hold your dice in your hand and cut it in the direction parallel to c axis then cut it in the direction parallel to xy plane and then xz plane 
you will be able to get eight small cubes out of it. Center of each cube, each octant is a tetrahedral hole. Four lattice point, eight tetrahedral holes. Four lattice point, four octahedral holes. All right? Okay. Now, this will need you to be with me to visualize octahedral and tetrahedral hole in HCP. We will not spend a lot of time, but we'll try to see if we can get across it. For tetrahedral, I will concentrate on this particular figure. Okay. So this is your A layer. This is your B layer, these orange dots, and this is your C layer. Octahedral and the holes have to be located between the two layers, right? In case of tetrahedral holes, consider on this orange. This and um, this is one particular unit cell, base of one unit cell. Okay, so if this is the one uh, tip of my tetrahedra, then there is one tetrahedral hole which will lie in this particular tetrahedra. And if you remember from your maths, the center of gravity of the tetrahedron is actually, if I draw a line from the tip to the base, it actually divides the center of gravity is three parts here and one part here. So the hole has to be not on the center. Suppose this was my uh, distance from the tip to the base, okay? Then, and this length is L, then the tetrahedral hole will not be at 0.5L. It will be here and it will be dividing this axis in the way that this part is three parts and this part is one part, okay? And now I would want to make you understand the coordinates of tetrahedral hole. Now, this is suppose my uh, entire uh, hexagonal thing, okay? And let me divide it into eight parts. Now, this is one tetrahedral hole I'm talking about, this particular hole, okay? If I, and why I'm dividing into eight parts? Because I want you to make this understand. This is three part, one part. This is my center of gravity. So the Z coordinate for this particular hole is one by eight, right? And uh, this hole, now if I go to the previous thing, Okay, let us first concentrate on the Z coordinate for the four tetrahedral holes that we are going to visualize in this. Okay, there will be one tetrahedral line this way. Now this orange atom will be involved in an inverted tetrahedra with this, this, all right. So the Z coordinate for this is one by eight. The Z coordinate for this hole will be 7 by 8. I hope this is clear here. Okay. And the next tetrahedral hole, uh, then, okay, uh, if I want to make you understand, basically, it is this. Uh, this and this lies on the axis of the unit cell. Okay. Uh, sorry, I need a better figure to make you understand. This, this, or we'll come back to it. Let me get back with a better figure to explain to the tetrahedral and octahedral voids in NCP. But this I would definitely want to do with you. Okay. Let's moving on to the crystal structure. We'll come back to the coordinates of these holes in the next class. I'll get a better figure for this for you to for it to be more explainable. Okay, talking about first structure, that is AX type crystal structure. We will start with the simplest structure that we know of. Rock salt structure, very commonly known as NaCl structure also. It is nothing, you, okay, whenever we define the structure, as I told you, 
will define it in two ways in terms of unit set, in terms of close packing, in terms of space filling polyhedra. So, in terms of close packing, we can say that it is an FCC of anions. This can be unit cell uh, representation also. So, anions form these pink circles are the anions that are forming face centered lattice. That is, they are occupying corners and the face center, and cations are occupying octahedral holes. So, where are the octahedral holes? We just talked about it in the body center as well as on the edge center. So, how many CL do we have? We have one on the corner, three on the faces, four CL. How many NAs do we have? We have one in the body center, that is one. And because of 12 edge center, we have three, four NA, four NA, four CL, one unit cell of NACL contains four units of NACL. I hope this is clear. Coordinates of anions are the coordinates of corner as well as face center. And the coordinates of cations are coordinates of body center and the edge center. Okay. Coordination number of Na. To visualize that, I'll take you to the next slide. Okay. This is how I can see. Now, in the corner, the orange one are chlorine and the blue one are sodium. Okay. So, what I have is Cl Na6 octahedra. Okay. Similarly, if I concentrate now on sodium, what I have is sodium in the center and it is connected to 6 Cl. So, Na Cl6 octahedra. Okay. That means coordination number of sodium is 6, coordination number of Na is 6. And how are they joined? If you simply concentrate on this particular polyhedra, you would be able to visualize that if I'm talking that these now concentrate on this edge. This edge is again the edge of another polyhedra. So NACL structure can be visualized as edge sharing NACL6 octahedra or CL NA6 octahedra. But we cannot claim both. Okay. So just remember that. So what I want to say is coordinated number of both NA and CL is 6. And this particular structure is adopted by NACL, KCL, silver chloride, magnesium oxide. Of course, the main criteria is that your cation and anion stoichiometry has to be 1 is to 1. What are the other criteria? Uh, okay. Okay, now another important structure. Of course, KCL is similar to NACL, MGO is similar to NACL, calcium carbide structure. Now, calcium carbide, whenever you will read, it will say it will adopt not the rock salt structure, but the rock salt like structure. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, this is your NACL packing. Okay. Now, carbide ion is an elongated ion. Normally, our chloride, sodium, those kind of ions are spherical. We generally assume that the electron density is spherical. Now, this is an elongated ion. If I place an elongated ion in place of this blue ion, what will happen is, and along the C axis, the A and B are similar, but the C becomes longer than A and B. So, even though your NaCl was cubic, the CaC2 is tetragonal. Okay. So, it does not have the rock salt structure. It has a rock salt like structure. All right. Sphalerite structure, another AX type of structure where the stoichiometry of anion and cation is 1 is to 1. Here, okay, we always say by convention, of course, we'll contradict ourselves in the next slide itself. By convention, we say that anions form close pattern. And you have to ask me why anions form, why do we say that? Why can't I say that the cation form close packing? This is because the uh, size of the interstices, interstices are holes, tetrahedral, octahedral hole, will be smaller than the ions which are forming the close packing. So what will happen is, normally anions are bigger, okay, cations are relatively smaller. If I am forming a lattice of the bigger ball, it is easier to place the smaller balls. 
but vice versa is not possible. So by convention, we say that anions form the close bond. Coming back to your zinc blend structure, which is also called sphalerite structure, ZNS, sulfide forms the face center of the anions. And all of us, we just discussed how many tetrahedral holes are there? Eight chotu cubes, eight tetrahedral holes. Now, all of those eight are not occupied. Alternate tetrahedral holes are occupied and we get the zinc sulfide structure. So, if sulfide is forming FCC, that means four sulfide atom. If four sulfide atom, this implies eight tetrahedral holes. Alternate tetrahedral holes means four tetrahedral holes are occupied and we get the stoichiometry of one is to one. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, another way is coordinates. Okay. Can ion ions and cation the coordinate now we can make out. Coordination number is easy to know. I am placing my zinc ion in the tetrahedral hole. So the coordination number has to be four. If you want to see the coordination number of your sulfur ion, you will also have to consider the cubes which are lying adjacent and then you will be able to see that it is Zn S4 as well as S Zn4 tetrahedral. All right. And they are sharing cormos. If all my tetrahedral holes were occupied, then they would have shared edges. Right now, they are sharing cormos. Okay. So the difference between, now you can ask me, both of them are AX, rock salt and ZNS. When is it that they adopt rock salt structure and when is it that they would adopt zinc blend structure? Most important thing is, the zinc blend structure is favored by relatively covalent compound. Okay. And this is favored by more ionic compound. By rule, okay, today you mark my word, by rule you would say whenever you have electrostatic attraction, whenever you have ionic compound, the ion tend to have more and more opposite charge ions around it. Why? Because the force of attraction will maximize and it will make it stable. But covalent compound do not have any such criteria. That is why in rock salt, what is the coordination number six? In zinc blend, what is the coordination number four? So the compounds which have the tendency to form covalent compound will adopt zinc blend structure. The compounds which have more ionic and electrostatic attraction will form rock salt type of compound. Other differences are simple. This is FCC of one ion, the other occupies octahedral. This is FCC of one ion, the other occupies alternate tetrahedral. In space, uh, Space filling polyhedra, we can say these are edge sharing octahedra, these are corner sharing tetrahedra. These are formed by oxide chalcogenides of alkaline earth metal and metal halides. These are formed by smaller ions because they form covalent compound. Okay. Of course, this will also depend upon the radius ratio of cation and anion, but we shall discuss about it a little later. All right. Uh, probably. Another two structure if we can cover and then we'll wind up this task. Cesium fluoride is a very simple structure. We say that one of the ions, either cesium or chloride. Cesium fluoride structure, mind you, is adopted by when both your cation and ion are big. All right. Uh, that is why it is able to occupy the site which has eight neighbors, not six, not four, eight neighbors. So one of the ions, either cation or an ion occupied corner, and the other occupy the body center. Simple cubic lattice. Never call it, most of the time in interviews, the students call it a body center lattice. When do we call it body center? When the atom at the center is similar to the lattice points at the corner. Then it is body center. All right. Uh, otherwise, when you're lattice points, atoms, ions, group of atom bases, whatever you're talking about at the body center and the corners are different. It is simple cubic lattice. All right. Okay. So what we say is one of the ion occupy the corner, the other occupy the body center. The coordinate of the ion that occupy the corner is zero, zero, zero. And the coordinate of the ion that occupy the body center is half, half, half. It is as simple as that. Coordination number is 8. 
okay and if you clearly observe it you can see that they are actually forming the face sharing tubes all right okay that's it for now next class we'll start with ax2 structure and try to wind it up go to the complex structure hopefully try to wind that up as well but i would want you to be a little more interactive with me for me to be you know motivated enough to come to next class okay so all the best revise doubts most welcome next class by mail whichever way you want okay good evening and uh, wish you all a good rest of the day all right okay there was one question Diti, what is the question you mean in tube? Can you be more specific? Uh, they will get the material, na, Rohit? You will get the study material, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, I think we can then wind up now and I'll see you in the next class. That's on red listing. All right. Thank you.